Hi, I'm Jeff Smith, and I do the Frugal Gourmet on Channel 2 in Boston. Have you made a pledge recently? I want you to hustle. Send it in right away, because I've got the soup pot hot, and it's going to boil over unless you join us and help soon. Send in that pledge card. We're waiting to hear from you at Channel 2 in good old Boston. Friday the 6th. It's Puccini's Madame Butterfly, as you've never seen it before. Exquisitely crafted, kabuki style by director Hal Prince. Wonderfully sung by Anna Tamava Sintoff, Peter Dvorsky, and Richard Setwell. Madame Butterfly, Friday the 6th. Then Friday the 13th. The imagination of Balanchine, the mastery of Barishnikov. From Stravinsky's Apollo to Jazz by Gershwin, Barishnikov dances Balanchine on Dance in America, Friday the 13th. That's Madame Butterfly and Dance in America, all coming up right here on Channel 2. This is member-supported Channel 2, the best television on television. Major funding for the Woodwright Shop is provided by State Farm Insurance Companies. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Additional funding is provided by this and other public television stations. you don't mind if we don't go to the shop today. In fact, it would be mighty difficult to do because it's about 3,000 miles that way. We are at the Weald and Downland Open Air Museum in West Sussex near the south coast of England. And here they are dedicated to preserving the local heritage of timber building, a heritage which of course soon was to come to America. And as we explore the place, I'm sure you will agree, they have some of the most beautiful and interesting buildings in one of the most beautiful locations anywhere on Earth. This little thatched cottage is the earliest of the buildings reconstructed here at the museum, and it had to be completely reconstructed. In fact, it's based just on the archaeological evidence. It's from the 13th century, so there wasn't much left when they found it. They did, however, compute the size of the walls from the volume of rubble that they found around in the area. And this little buttress, again, there was archaeological evidence for the buttress. It's a very, very early building. And it's composed of flint cobbles and chalk. And of course, that's what all of Southeast England is made of, is flint cobbles and chalk in the soil. The roof is covered with straw thatch, but it may have been turf, it may have been stone slates, hard to tell. There's uh, wood, of course, framing up the roof, but very little in the rest of the building, just around the doorway. Now, earlier, earliest houses in England may have been uh, post set. What they did was, of course, dig a hole, stick a post in the ground, and put a beam on top, just as Stonehenge is composed. Well, neither of these are really carpentry, and it's the timber building, the carpentered building, that became the English house. Of course, Britain is famous for its timber, the oak, and beech, hardwood forest. Most Americans would be familiar with that kind of environment. What you may not recognize, though, is this. This is coppice. Coppice work is where trees are cut off and then allowed to re-sprout into shoots that are very straight, easily worked, and form an important part of building. They use hazel, beech, a hornbeam, and they could be harvested again 
every seven years, and you'll find them all through English buildings. Those materials, the timber and the coppice hazel, and a few centuries of experience combined to develop carpentry in England. And this little building, although it's late, this is from the 16th century, is a good uh, place to see the kind of complexity that carpentry involves. Imagine cutting these braces, the angles, the joints that fit one within another. Many complex tools requiring specialized tool makers, quite a bit more complicated than simply piling up stones one atop another and mortaring them together. This little farm building is good to see the bare framing on the timber frame because it's not been completely infilled. Uh, actually, this is the way it's intended to be left. The panels here just have the wattles in them. The daub has not gone on to make the traditional half-timbered Tudor buildings that we always think of. The, what they've done here, what they always do, is uh, to stick staves into little pockets between the timbers and then interweave the hazel rods, which then form a base for the plaster that makes the half-timbered buildings that are so beautiful from the Tudor period. Well, this is a farm building, and they were often not plastered on farm buildings. In fact, this building was to house a tread wheel. And if you're not sure what a tread wheel is, there's one inside, and we'll take a look at it. In fact, we'll not just take a look at it, we'll give it a whirl. This is a tread wheel. It's a way of harnessing human energy. Here, in this case, it's a giant squirrel cage that a fellow can walk in, and it's used here to raise water from a well, a big barrel of water from a very deep well. The original well that this tread wheel came from was over 300 feet deep, and the fellow raising the water had to walk over a third of a mile inside this tread wheel before the bucket came all the way up from the well. And of course, farms and taverns would have this. Now, once you're at the top, you've got to, of course, dump the water out. Uh, there's a story of two boys who were raising water from this well, and one of them uh, jumped off before the water was dumped. And of course, that overbalanced it, and the other little boy started going backwards all of a sudden. Before he knew it, he was out of sight. Ah! There's so many fascinating things to see here at the museum, but we'll concentrate on carpentry for now. And chronologically, this is where you begin. This is a medieval hall from Boar Hunt in Hampshire from the 15th century. And I say a hall, it's just one great open space inside. There's no chimney or anything. The spire was in the middle and the smoke drifted up through the thatch. And in that one room, the family, the servants, everyone lived, worked, slept. That's where it all happened. And you can see the great timbers and the way it's infilled with the wattle and daub. This is what the wattle and daub looks like when it's daubed and whitewashed over, the great oak timbers. But what makes this a very a fascinating piece of construction, this kind of early crook framing that supports the roof. There are cross frames, great curved timbers that divide that great hall, and these timbers are called crooks. And it's a, it's a unique form of English construction. Well, you'll see it inside. Now, these crux not only support the roof, but they also divide the space into what are called bays. So between each set of cross frames, you have a bay. This is a two-bay hall, in the center of which is the hearthstone. Now, on this, the fire will be burning and the smoke drifting up through the thatch and blackening the timbers of the crux. Now, these crux are not like the ordinary crux you find in the rest of England that go all the way to the peak of the roof. These crux stop at the purlins, and they're called base crux. They're very rare. There's only 90 examples of these kind of base crux in existence, six of which are in the area of the Weald and Downland. All the houses at the Weald and Downland Museum come from the Weald and Downland area of England. Now, these hills behind me are the downs. They're flint and chalk, and they form a horseshoe-shaped range to the south and southeast of London. Now, nestled in the middle of the horseshoe is the Weald, an area of sandstone and clay, which in the Middle Ages was covered with magnificent oak forests. Now, if these timbers had any feelings at all, it could only be feelings of pride if they knew that they were going to be shaped into the house that you're going to see next. Now, this is the good stuff. This is bay leaf. Bayleaf is a 15th century hall from Kent. 
and it is called a Wielden type house because of these characteristics. As you can see, it's jettied out on the chambers at either end. They overhang that ground floor. But if you look, of course, in the center, it's not overhanging at all. That is because the center is still a medieval hall. There is no second floor to hang out. So the jetties are only on either end. The center is recessed. And of course, here, where you have a jetty coming out on both sides of a house, you have to have diagonal timbers. And you have that wonderful thing, the dragon beam, diagonally coming out from the house. Now, this is a beautiful building. This is the kind of building that a man of wealth and taste would have. And here in the buttery, you can see how the dragon beam has to support all of the common joists that have been trimmed diagonally on their ends. Now, this is the only way you can get a jetty coming off of both corners of your building. But of course, this makes for some very expensive carpentry. And the man who had to pay for all of this, of course, did have a few privileges. He could sit here at the high table and admire the wonderful carpentry that he had paid so much for. And the carpenters that built these houses knew enough to put the fair side of the frame facing into where the master's purview could appreciate what he had paid so much for. And here you see the beautiful bracing of the cross frame that runs across to delineate this bay and support the roof. Now, he didn't have to sit here and worry about this in public. When he got tired of all this crowd and noise and hoi polloi, he could indeed retire to a chamber at the end of the house. One of the interesting things about this solar bay, as it's called, is this cross beam right across the middle of the room. Now, why on earth would you have a beam going this way at right angles to the rest of the cross frames of the house? Well, this is an intentional decorative effect. It gives the room the effect of being a two-bay cross wing rather than just another room of the same frame house. So it makes it look like a bigger, more dignified room. But see what it's supporting. There is the crown post, the crown post that takes the load of the roof and transmits that weight down to the cross beam, down through the rest of the frame to the ground. Now, a beautiful effect, and of course, practical as well. And there are many practical considerations uh, we have to think of, and one of them is right here. This is the garter robe. In the 15th century, we have, of course, the privy, and it gives you a small room in the house for thinking great thoughts. There was not much plumbing involved, but at least it was indoors. Yet it was another convenience that was to end the days of smoke-filled hall houses such as Bayleaf and change the way people lived. The chimney, in the time of Elizabeth I and William Shakespeare, changed housing design forever. And you can see it in this house, Pendine from Midhurst, Sussex. Gone is the great hall. When you open the front door, no longer do you come in on the fire and the family at work and eating. No, instead, you open into a little lobby and a fireplace stack in the middle. Now, it's the individual fireplaces in each individual room that allowed people to separate because there's a floor level right here, rooms above, rooms below, each with their own fireplace so a family can stay in the same house and yet have their own private spaces. Yet, what's so interesting about this house is, although it has the modern fireplace and individual rooms, it still retains so many characteristics of the medieval hall. The windows have only mullions in them, these diamond-shaped timbers, and there's simply a shutter to close out the most severe weather. The room above is open all the way up to the roof tiles. And between the timbers, although you have brick below, above you still have the wattle and daub. Now, this is the kind of house that Englishmen were familiar with when they first came to the New World. But these wattle and daub panels, although they hold up under the gentle English rains, they won't stand the downpours of the New World. But there was something else that was different in the New World, of course. Timber was becoming scarce in England. I had to fight off the Armada, and of course, the farmland had cleared it, and the new iron-making industries used up so much timber that it was beginning to get scarce. Well, in America, those untapped timber resources allowed people to cover their houses with wood. So this became the American house. Yet here, we still see how it retains the flavor of the original timbered English home. 
As beautiful as these timber buildings are, it's hard to believe anybody would ever stop building them. But in the 17th century, the inevitable happened, and they started to fall out of fashion. Now, this was the new look. Napped flint walls, brick corners, brick surrounds about the glass windows. People started wanting houses built of more permanent materials to make a stronger, more steadfast statement. Well, you see that look right here in this house from Walderton, Sussex, which appears on the outside to be a perfectly normal 17th century home. Inside, it's a perfectly normal 17th century home with a perfectly normal 17th century iron casement window with leaded canes and diamond panes to let the fresh air in or if it's too cold to keep the cold air out. And until you have lived in a house with just mullions and no glass, you have no idea what an addition to creature comfort having glass in your windows is. It's a big change in the way you live. Now, to get some warmth inside the house, of course, you've got the central fireplace, or in this case, a bake oven. This was the bakery of the house. And to keep it clean, because you're preparing food in here, you've got fired brick, easy maintenance floor. Now, as easy as this is to live in and to work in and to keep clean, you can still get tired. So when you do get tired, you can easily retire to the upstairs chamber, which is a perfectly normal 17th century chamber with the low ceiling and the white plastered walls, perfectly normal until you step over here and see that within this building is a 15th century hall house. It has been modified. In the 17th century, uh, this hall was covered, <laughs> covered with plaster, a floor inserted, and it was made into a modern house. And what they've done here is they've left it half and half. I've got one foot in the world a hundred years before Shakespeare's birth and another foot in a hundred years after Shakespeare's birth. You can see the difference between the black soot covered wattles going all the way up to the ceiling when this was a great hall and the modern white plastered individual rooms that people could have once you had fireplaces inside and the glass windows to control the environment inside. So people are being separated from one another. They're getting more separate from their environment. But it's, it's what you do. This is modern living. You can see how they did it here. Timber buildings really fell out of fashion. They took the timbers out on the side walls, the, the wattle and daub panels, and refilled it with flint and mortar and laid up the walls underneath them, retaining the cross frames, and then plastered over these walls, put in brick to make the mullions and the window surrounds and the corners, and simply made a 15th century house into a 17th century house. So every 200 years, you just remodel. So really, these houses, they're, they're kind of like grandfather's axe. They never wear out. It's had nine heads and 16 handles, and it's still going strong. Fortunately, people continued to build timber buildings throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. Now, this granary, infilled with brick, was built in 1731. How can I tell? It's easy. There's a brick right here with the date 1731 pressed into it. A curious thing about this granary, about 80% of the timber is elm, not white oak. Now, elm is a good building timber, but it's easily attacked by the worms. So if this had been a little older building, it probably would not have survived. Now, another enemy, of course, of the grain inside are the rats that try and get up in and eat it. And that's why it stands upon staddles. These are made of Portland stone. And all throughout the countryside around here, granaries sit on identical staddles like this. So they were mass produced. A rat can't do that underside climbing there to get up into the grain. I know what you're thinking. Of course, an industrious rat could just go right up the steps. They thought of that. The steps are removable. So the rats can't get in, even if they should find the key. Well, obviously, it takes very clever people to do this kind of work. And one of them is here working on the barn. He's the director of research at the Wheeldon Downland Museum, Hi. Richard Harris. Hello, good to see you, Richard. All right. Richard, you're working on a barn here, is that right? Yes, it's a, a threshing barn for wheat. Well, what, well how, what's it doing here at the museum? Shouldn't it be back in the village where it was originally built? It, it should be, it should be, but barns like this are, are now useless for all practical purposes and very expensive oh. to maintain. So farmers want to get rid of them uh, unless they find some other use for them. And this farmer wanted to get rid of this, and we took it rather than see it destroyed. 
So is that the policy of the museum, that you'll only take a building if it's going to be destroyed? That's right, yeah, it has to be due for destruction. Oh, well, it's a wonderful thing. Now, once they get here, of course, they go into the hospital, and I see you've yeah. done some work on the, the timbers here. Is this a good example? Yeah, this is a good example here. They, the, some of the timbers uh, become rotten or broken and have to be repaired. Now, how do you do this? Do you use a, uh, I guess you use a mixture, then, of modern and traditional techniques to restore the timbers? Yes, the, the repair joints are, are carpenter joints, uh, but we also use glues and, and sometimes uh, steel even to keep them together. Uh, the timber is um, modern oak, uh, matching the old oak. It's the same material. Is it as, as good as the old oak? It's as good as the old oak, indeed it is. Yeah, you've got to choose it carefully. Well, how about the carpenters? The carpenters, the craftsmen, as good as the old craftsmen? There is, they are. They know all the old techniques now, um, but of course they have to be a cross between a museum conservator and a timber frame carpenter, oh. and that's not a combination that's easy to come by. So the building's a great, huge artifact that has to be restored. Absolutely. Well, well, what are its enemies? What are the holes here in, in this timber? <coughs> the, these are a wood-boring beetle uh, we call furniture beetle in this country. It's, um, it only attacks the very surface of the wood. It doesn't go very far down. But no termites? No termites, no. We well, have another one called death watch beetle, which uh, makes a bigger hole. Mm. Those are the only two. Well, Richard, a lot of people have written for years about the differences, the local variations in English carpentry, but you've talked to me about the national language of English carpentry. Can you show us that on this barn? Yes, I can. It, it's... Um, not something that uh, we talk about very usually in England. Come up the ladder and have oh, a look. Michelle, all right. Um, most people concentrate on the regional dialect variations in carpentry, but when you look at a joint like this, yes. here, the, the, the beam is uh, lap dovetailed down onto the plate. Oh, okay. Now, this yeah. beam then, ha we can't see it, but there's a right. splayed out dovetail inside on top. there. That's right. And that joint occurs in, in pretty well all English timber frame buildings. Uh, it doesn't occur in, in French and German ones, and so I th think it's fair to see it as a, like an English piece of grammar, really. All right, so that's the language. language. We've got yeah. a tenon here and a tenon here, and that that's dovetail, it. which keeps the plate from coming from apart, strengthens the yeah. whole thing. Uh, and so the, the carpenter <coughs> will spend his apprenticeship learning to build buildings in just the same way as we learn to speak a, speak a language. I see. Think it's assemblies like that, and just like the grammatical glue that keep the building together. All right, now, now we always talk about the English and the Americans as being two nations separated by a common language. Do they do this in America? They did uh, at first in New England, and it does survive in New England, but as so many other European carpenters from other countries came across, uh, um, they rapidly developed other techniques, and you don't get that joint surviving as long in America as it did still huh. in England. Well, this, in America, this, this thickening, now, of course it's thickened, I guess, to, to, add, to be able to take all these yeah. joints, that's called a gunstock post in America. Is that what it's called? No, there? we call it the jowl of, of the post. And of course, it's the, 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 the bottom of the tree. Uh, the really? top of the tree is down there, and this is the thickening uh, lower part of the tree, yeah. That's the lower part of the yeah. tree. Huh. Well, how do you feel about the carpenter who did this work? I mean, was this appropriate carpentry to the job? Was he cutting any corners? Or? Uh, he, he was doing a quick job, but it's all done correctly, but so quickly. This is what the farmer could afford, so it was appropriate yeah, yeah. to the building. It was not, not trying to cheat him. Well, marvelous work, and I know you're very excited about this kind of work you're doing here, and you've got a new building, is that right? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. We're a, just taking a bakehouse down at the moment, a 19th century uh, bake oven. Oh, so anyone coming here, they might be able to see that soon. Indeed, we hope so. Hmm. Well, Richard, thank you very much. We've only seen a little of what's here, but we're going to have to hurry on if we're going to see any of the rest. So thank you so much. All right. We've worked as the country mouse now. I think it's time we took a look at uh, what city mouse is up to. Well, the houses that we've seen so far are rural and farm buildings, but of course there was life in the villages as well. And here you see some of the medieval village houses that they have restored here at the museum. And the characteristic feature, of course, of any medieval town are the jetties coming out over the street. The second floor extended out over the first. Now, everybody has to have an explanation as to why people did this sort of thing. They say, well, the most logical one, of course, is to say to get extra room in a crowded city, and it's true. Uh, extending the second floor out over the first would give you 10 to 20% more room in the upper floors. Look at this one, double jettied out. So this would protect passers-by from rain and garbage raining down uh, from above and worse. And of course, this lower floor was rented out as shops, and so this would force people up to protection and they could buy whatever was going on in these shops here. Now, there are also technical explanations of the jetty. People would say, well, putting the load out cantilevered the floor inside the house up so you could get a longer span inside. But there's really no evidence that they were 
aware of that effect, if it really is an effect in these kind of buildings. I really think the most reasonable explanation is just look at it. That's it. It's a beautiful building, and this is the kind of expression of carpentry, of, of ostentatious carpentry, that would show the kind of wealth and power that you had. And, of course, what better place to show it than in the market hall. Now, this would stand in the center of town, and this arcade is a place where people could sell their wares. And this would be the statement of the wealth of the entire community. And it's not just the fancy carpentry that shows this is an important building. It's not just the jetties and the carving and everything. No, the use of this increasingly scarce material shows that this is an important building. Look at how the timbers are very close together, filled with diagonal brick. Now, contrast that with the original hall we saw with wide panels filled in with wattle and daub. Now, this is the space below where merchants could sell their goods if they didn't have a shop of their own. And up above is a chamber where the Chamber of Commerce could gather and meet. Like so many buildings, the Market Hall has a clay tile roof on it. You can see a clay tile roof on this building right here. The one next to it, however, has what are called Horsham slabs. Now, they're big splits of sandstone just laying up there on the roof. Now, how do you think they're held on? Well, you can see right here in the roof of the Market Hall, the clay tiles are pierced while they're still green before they're fired, and that gives you a place to put through oak tile pins. And these are hanging over cleft oak uh, lattice work going horizontally on the building. Now, the condition of the roof, of course, is what determines largely how well a building is going to survive. The roof goes, the rest of the building goes, because the timber will rot. And that's what happened greatly with the timbers of the Market Hall. But you can see right here the marvelous work that they've done at the museum to preserve the original timber. They kept the original timber, but had to replace the tenon and the mortise down beneath. So they've arrested the decay, and this building is not one that got away. Well, any town big enough to have its own market hall is big enough to have its share of baddies. And beneath the stairway of the market hall, there is a little lockup, a cage. And it takes detective work not only to catch miscreants in need of incarceration, it takes detective work to find where missing timbers went for the restoration. Now, they knew that there were mortises in this timber here on the underside, but this part of the market hall was missing. Well, fortunately, they also had a letter from a carpenter, an 18th century carpenter in Chichester named Mr. Spearshot, and he wrote of beneath the stairs of the market hall, there is a cage boarded up waist high with perpendicular bars above. So with those two clues, they were able to complete the restoration of this marvelous medieval market hall. Well, I'm sure that the beautiful English countryside has captured your fancy just as it has mine. The Weald and Downland Museum in West Sussex, England is a wonderful place to visit. But even more important, it's an inspiration. This was done by local people who were concerned about preserving their local building heritage. And although we may not have buildings as striking as bay leaf behind me, we still have buildings that are just as significant to our own story. And they don't have to be moved to a museum either. They can be preserved on site. So look around you. You'll find them. They need your help. In the meantime, I thank you for your help. This has been Roy Underhill in the Woodwright Shop. So long. Tonight at 8, watch the power game. A look at the dynamics of power politics in the nation's capital. Tonight with a look at the presidency. Because of this special program, this old house will be seen tonight a half hour earlier than usual at 7.30. That's tonight only.